The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. The arts of all kinds offer insight into the human condition. But how can the cultural festivals we've come to know and love deliver on their mandates in the midst of a global pandemic? Well, tonight we'll meet the new head of the Luminato Festival Toronto, Celia Smith, to find out. Also, we revisit a conversation from earlier this season about film and television production in Ontario and how the sector is trying to get its groove back. It's Wednesday, October 14th, and that's next on The Agenda. The Luminato Arts and Culture Festival has been around for 13 years. It happens every June, but for some reason, it's never really achieved the kind of prominence in Ontario's capital city region that its founders envisioned. Which may be why, when you ask its new CEO what she wants to achieve on the job, her answer is, I want to inspire the city. A big goal made even harder during these times of pandemic. Let's find out how she intends to do it. Here's Celia Smith the new CEO of Luminato Festival Toronto, and she comes to us from the east end of the provincial capital. So nice to have you on our airwaves for the first time. How are you managing? Well, this is a great time to be running a live performing arts festival, I tell you. It's fantastic. <laughs> now, are you being facetious? Because that sure sounds like something facetious. Well, honestly, it's crazy. It's a, it's a crazy time to do this, but I think everything is possible. I do. Hmm. I don't think there are any rules anymore. I think that's out the window. Well, let's start with this, because as we pointed out in the intro, not as many people may know of Luminato, certainly as you would like. So why don't we start there? What is Luminato? So Luminato is an annual performing arts festival. It's happened for uh, 14 years in the city of Toronto, all over the city. And it features Toronto's artists, the region's artists, and usually artists from around the world. And it's every kind of genre you might think of. The word luminato actually means illuminated in Italian, and it raises a kind of a corny follow-up for me, which is, has this festival not shone as brightly as you wished it would in the past? Well, I'll tell you what I want to have happen. I want everyone around the world, even those who are in the space station, to say, there's a big bright light coming from this Toronto region. We can see it from a distance. What is going on? What the heck is going on in Toronto? Why are those people so optimistic? Why are they so filled with energy and hope at this time when the whole world is facing so many systemic challenges? Why are those people in Toronto, why do they think that they can tackle this? Where do they get their energy from? And I think Luminato should be part of that, part of building that kind of energy and that kind of uh, hope. Well, you were essentially brought in to transform this arts festival, and I guess I want to know from what to what? Well, Luminato has had 14 great years, done some incredible work, some beautiful art, some wonderful artists, but I don't think everyone in Toronto even knows we exist. And our purpose is to inspire the city region and by extrapolation, the world. So next year, We'll produce a festival regardless of the COVID situation. It'll be online, it'll be broadcast, and it will be live. And it will be all free, all outside, all over the city and the city region. And it will include all local artists and arts organizations. And if you can't attend, we'll be virtual. And if you can't attend, then we'll be dancing in the streets. <laughs> okay, I jotted that down because as far as I know, those three alls, all free, all outside, all local, that's all new, right? Uh, yes, in its, in its entirety, yes it is. Because mm -hmm. yes. certainly one of the things I'd heard about Luminato in the past might have been from people who said, you know, that looks interesting, but I'm not sure I can afford to go because it costs too much. So that's not going to be an issue next year. That's not going to be an issue. And in addition to that, all kinds of accessibility are at the core of what we're doing. So there really is no reason why everyone can't uh, get involved and be engaged in this and inspired by this. And when you say all local, do I take it this means you're not going to be flying people in from all over North America as the festival did in the past? For this next year, 
I think we should all shop local. We should buy our bread from the store at the top of the street, because if we don't, that bread store will not be here. And I feel the same about the artistic and creative community in this Toronto region. We've got incredible talent here and we need to support them, engage with them and put money in their pockets. So artists, arts organizations, other creators in this region, that's who we need to showcase this year. And going forward, we'll keep this as a base, absolutely. At some point, we'll be able to travel again. And of course, we would welcome uh, the best from around the world back to Toronto, yes. But this year, uh, no, we're gonna, we're gonna shop local. There is something kind of ironically coincidental about what you're trying to do right now, given how, Ilu uh, given how Luminato started in the first place. Do you want to remind us about uh, 2007 and what was happening in this province at that time? So we were recovering from SARS, mm -hmm. uh, which had decimated the tourism industry in Toronto and, and in this region. And Tony Galliano and David Pico and other uh, civic-minded citizens came up with the idea that we needed a, a performing arts festival that would celebrate the best of Toronto and bring it to the world and bring the best of, Tor of the world to Toronto and that we would uh, engage on a, on a city building initiative through the arts. So that was the origin story for Illuminato and that's how it started. And as you know, as we've gone through the years, we've done that to a greater and lesser degree. And it's, it's more than ironic that here we are 14 years later and uh, well, this is way more than SARS <laughs> that we're gonna have to dig ourselves out of. Bigger hole this time, isn't it? Much bigger hole. Yeah. 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 I have heard you describe, I know it's the 14th year for Luminato, but I've heard you describe it as year minus one. What does that mean? <laughs> well, if you do the math, we'll be 20 in 2026, which normally people think of sort of five-year plans. Well, this is year minus one of the next five years, because this year is purely an experimentation year. You can't see it any other way, given the current conditions. Everything we know about how we do what we do in the live performing arts is being challenged and constrained. So uh, we're gonna do things differently. So we're gonna try all kinds of things. And I would challenge anyone to say, oh, that isn't what you do. That's not how we do it. Hmm. Oh, we don't know how to do that. I mean, of course we're all thinking that, but actually you also can try all kinds of new things. I mean, the stuff that's being produced online now here and around the world and the quality of expression from our artists and organizations, we just wouldn't have thought we could have done this a year ago. But through constraints, people are coming up with all kinds of new hybrid offerings. So I think it's a, you have to see it that way. It's a choice. Um, optimism is a choice because and, the alternative is the easier route. Sure. And, and just to be clear, it's going to be in June again, as always? It will be in June. We'll open on June the 10th and we'll run through three weekends through the majority of June all over the city, all free, all outside. All local. And are you prepared yet to sort of give us some hints about what we will see next June? Well, I will tell you that if we are able to be in the streets, you'll be singing and dancing alongside us um, with some fabulous artists, some of whom you're very familiar with and some you have never heard of. So that will be exciting for you. And if we're not able to be in the streets and we're all uh, in our homes, We'll have drones and videographers and fabulous filmmakers capture it all and share it with you anyway. Hmm. Okay. Are, are, can you tell us what Luminato's budget is? It's a six and a half million dollar budget. So that's enough money to do some pretty big stuff. Would you agree? That's right. That's right. And we are also collaborating with a lot of other organizations and helping them and share it with them to produce a lot of work and employ a lot of artists. And what's the mix between how much you get from various levels of government and how much you raise from private sources? In this current year, uh, we get about three quarters of it from all three levels of government. And the remainder, uh, so several million dollars, we are, we're fundraising. Now, I don't because have... we won't have any ticket sales. Right, right. Uh, I don't have to tell you that governments have gone wildly into debt uh, in order to handle the ravages of this global pandemic, are you sure that the money that you're counting on is going to be there for you? We're in uh, commitments with government and we're very focused on delivering what it is that they need. They need us to help build social confidence and bring people back into the, into the streets. And that's what we're going to do. On the philanthropic and sponsorship side, 
we've been entering into conversations and people have been extremely generous and responsive to this message. People are interested in participating in the reactivation of the city and bringing people some hope. And you feel, what, a considerable amount of pressure on your shoulders to contribute to that and make that happen, I suppose? We will be a convener and a catalyst to that. Um, I like to say I'm not at the front of the parade. I'd like to be in the middle of the parade <laughs> as we figure this out. <laughs> well, you know what they say in politics is that if you're, um, if you're a leader uh, and you got nobody following you, you're just a guy out for a walk. So you don't want to be that, I presume. No, that's not very interesting. <laughs> okay. C can I just ask a bit about you? Because you're new on the job and there's going to be lots of people watching us right now who, who don't know you. Where are you from and where did you just come from previous to taking on the Luminato responsibilities? Right. Well, I, uh, I lived in Toronto since I was 10, but I grew up in Northern Ontario, which those who know me know that that says everything about, about who I am and my approach. Uh, and I ran Canadian stage for many, many years uh, and worked in the arts sector in Toronto. And then for a long time, uh, was one of the leaders at Artscape, which is a not-for-profit property developer. So I built the city alongside many others. I built affordable housing for artists and their families, and I built community hubs like the Witchwood Barns or Daniel Spectrum in Regent Park, those, those kinds of places. Uh, and then most recently, I was working for an enlightened private developer equally building affordable housing and public realm spaces. So I literally have spent the last 15 years building the city. So uh, I would say that that's, I guess I get to have that title as a city builder legitimately. But now I'm going to do it in a, in a more ephemeral way. And where in Northern Ontario are you from? North Bay. Oh, well that's, you know Trout what? Trout Lake. I was gonna say. Trout Pete. Lake, North Bay. People who live in, in in what is really Northern Ontario would not consider North Bay Northern Ontario. I know you were going to say that, but if you've ever went, lived through a winter in North Bay, I think we get to I think we get to claim that. Yeah, I have not, but I've spent lots of time in Sudbury, which is not too far away, and therefore, I, I, I feel you, as the kids say. I think I think that's yeah, yeah I think that's the expression. Uh, I, I you know I'm not from Toronto, but I have lived here for uh, 42 years. Uh, but you ask me where I'm from, and I say Hamilton, I guess in the same way you say I'm from Northern Ontario. Says it all. Yeah. D do you think it's actually more helpful to be from somewhere else and yet transplanted here to do your thing? Well, I think uh, the stats say that most of us who live in Toronto consider that we came from somewhere else. So we're a community of, of people who choose to be here. So I think that says a lot about us. I have, uh, again, it's a choice to live in Toronto. I have high hopes for this city. I think that we have a lot um, of brilliant people here. And I think we can figure some things out. Hmm. Let me ask you about one of the criticisms that we have heard in the past about Luminato, which is that it has been seen in some quarters as that kind of artsy-fartsy festival that is very much located both geographically and in, in its sensibility with being a downtown thing. And if you're not really part of the downtown scene, you don't really feel like you've got a piece of the action. I guess first question is, is that a fair criticism from the past? I think it's a broad criticism. You could say that on some of the programming and some of the experiences, that is true. I also know that Luminato has produced all over the city in the past and produced a lot of free local work in partnership with the community. But I think the takeaway is people may not remember that. The idea they have in their head is one of a downtown organization. So whether that was the reality or not. So I think to counter that, to legitimately go into a wide number of neighborhoods and really connect with people there and, and really offer participation in a way that um, is really memorable and transformative, I think that's how you overcome it. Okay, let me follow up on that then. If you live in, like never mind North York or Scarborough, but if you live in York region, if you live in Thornhill or you live in Oshawa or you live in Mississauga, uh, are you gonna feel rooted to Luminato in a way that you hadn't in the past if you have your way? Yes. So we're looking at some programming next year that's in one of those locations you just mentioned that I won't confirm. Um, and in the following year, looking at uh, several more of those locations, because part of it is is uh, actually bringing bringing the work and actually participating with the artists and the citizens in those areas, actually doing it. 
So yes, you'll see some next year and more the year after. And the idea is actually to do events in these locations outside of downtown Toronto, not merely, I shouldn't say merely, but not solely having them hooked up via online. That's right. That's right. It'll all be live work. The basis will be live work, which we will then film and broadcast. Now, whether there are more than 25 of us in the live experience will be another matter outside of my control right now. <laughs> Speaking of which, how many people have you got on staff to make all this happen anyway? Oh, a small but mighty team. There are about 20 people full-time at Luminato, and then it, many dozens more contractors, fabulous producers, uh, obviously artists um, and partners who, uh, who participate and show up and help us as we get closer to the festival. Hmm. So it's quite a large team. Also, I should say, about 700 volunteers huh. who come back every year. Yeah. And l let me ask the, uh, the Donald Trump question here, which is, what's in it for them, the volunteers? Why do they do it? I wasn't sure what question you were going to come up with. <laughs> I think to be associated with something that's fun and exciting and transformative for the city, I think that's really attractive. And we take care of our volunteers, so they have a rewarding time. I presume you do do a lot of sitting around, though, wondering what the status of the pandemic will be next June. Not right now. We know we're into a second wave right now. But by next June, where this thing may be, because presumably that will hugely factor into what you can or cannot do. Am I right? Yes. So we have sort of three doors in the game show, if you will. And door B is if I was to produce the festival this weekend. So these conditions that we are under sort of a, a version of lockdown, a little bit outside, a little bit not, we'll have a virtual version of what we're doing based on live experiences. And a few people will be able to actually be there in the streets with us. And if it gets worse, then it's entirely virtual and there and you know it's very limited in terms of live experience and if it gets better that's the easy part we're very accustomed to doing tens of thousand people attending large-scale events so so it'd be terrific if we could actually move towards that but um we're kind of planning for all three scenarios you're planning for three different scenarios right now yeah. okay that's that sounds complicated is it well, it's not really. I mean, the main scenario is if I was doing it this weekend, it's virtual and it's live and it's live with limited audience. Got it. So it's going to be live regardless. So in the worst case, it's just live. I mean, sorry, it's just it's just a broadcast. And in the best of situations, we welcome more people. But the main experience is a COVID friendly, socially distanced, safe festival. Hmm. Are there other festivals anywhere else in North America or for that matter around the world that you point to and say, that's a model for us. We need to be more like that. We're taking our cues from them because they do it so well. I'd love to, you know, whatever they've got, I want to bottle that and I want to bring it here. And if so, what is it? Well, I'll say we're all just figuring it out. I mean, I don't know how familiar you are with the festival circuit, but everyone has a certain time of year, right? So, so the ones that are in January got away with their festivals and now they're madly planning. And so we'll be watching how January goes for them, regardless of you know whether they're in Australia or, or Asia or wherever, and how much they're able to uh, hybrid it virtually and how much they're able to do uh, live. So we're definitely looking at that and we're in constant contact with those organizations anyway, because we would be um, in the big circuit. Uh, there are a few uh, places in Dublin, there was a theatre festival that was out in the last couple of weeks, and it's worth just looking them up because very clever uh, switch on their programming to like one person shows, one audience member, one artist, a show, or complete the show is completely on the telephone, that kind of thing. It's <laughs> worth looking at. It's, it's like, wow, they must have a lot of funding in Ireland, but regardless, <laughs> it's very creative and inventive. So there are a million great examples around the world about how people are doing this. And a lot here, some fantastic work from local organizations who, who really have figured out a different way of presenting what they're doing right now. So we look at all of that and talk to all of them. But I assume that in normal times, you'd be hopping on airplanes all the time, going to all these festivals to pick up you know, helpful tips and make valuable contacts and so on. Do I gather you can't do any of that now? It's my friend Zoom. It's all it's <laughs> all on the phone and Zoom. <laughs> I'll Zoom all the time. I'll Zoom every day, all the time. Hmm. How are you finding that? 
Well, I'm uh, leading a team of people that, except for a, a picnic in the park, a little visit in the park, I haven't met. I've been uh, leading them since the spring, and uh, and I don't actually get to meet them in person. We um, we do it like this, and it's remarkable how how you can make do. It's actually okay. Okay, Th that that is what's the technical word I'm looking for here? That is crazy. You've got all these employees, <laughs> and you haven't even met them yet. Right. Right. So we met. We met once in a park, so we laid eyes on each other, so we know we exist, but that's it. Um, and what's interesting is uh, you have to work harder at at the understanding the cues uh, because it's filtered, right? But we have to get along with it anyway. And I don't think we're going back to in-person for some time, so we have to make this work. Hmm. Uh, how long is your term with Luminato? Six years because uh, the chair, Peter Herndorf and I, have discussed the 2026, 20, 20th anniversary of Luminato as the mountaintop. And we'd both like to, we'd both like to get to the mountaintop. So <laughs> we'll get, we have a vision to get there together and then we'll see what happens after that. We should say in the interest of full disclosure, Mr. Herndorf is a former chair and CEO of this organization and uh, had the very poor judgment 28 years ago of hiring me and bringing me in here. So we just well, there you go, and I'm I'm like the second to that. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> we put that on the record for people's edification. I guess um, you know Premier Ford's got this slogan that he likes to say, which is, "I can't make decisions if I can't measure stuff." You know, so it's very important for him to to have testing results so that he can measure how well we're doing and therefore plan accordingly. And I guess I'd I'd I want to make the same kind of um, uh, put the same kind of question to you. How will you know if the new Luminato Festival coming next June is successful? Well, there's some you know, specific quantitative things we can do. We can track the number of people who participate, either live or virtually. We can you know, track where they're coming from, how long they participate, what they're interested in. Um, and you can do some extrapolation from that to see were there any other impacts in the community as a result of their participation with us. It's going to be challenging because so much of it may be virtually, but nonetheless. So we'll quantify that. And we generally survey everybody after their experiences. So we also have some idea of you know, what were the other softer impacts of the experience on them in addition to say economic or, or social impacts. So, so we do all of that every year anyway, and we set up our own benchmarks and and then see if we can exceed those. I think in addition, because we're in this time, there's some very specific expectations about social confidence that uh, that we should be putting on ourselves. And I've reviewed this with the team quite extensively. I mean, one of the purposes of what we're trying to do is to is to bring us all back out into the street and help us get over. We are all filled with anxiety, anxiety about being out, anxiety about, are you going to come too close to me? You know, are you sick and you don't know it? And there's just a lot that we're all living with. And so how can what we do actually inspire people to come back out safely and build the confidence to interact again? Because if we do that, then we might go back to having a resilient community and small businesses success and and everything else that we love about about the city so it's um how we measure that that will be a challenge to figure that out There's well a lot of factors that will be working against us indeed however you do it uh, we wish you well you've got a big challenge ahead that's celia smith who's the new ceo of the luminato festival toronto and we're really grateful you spared some time for us on TVO tonight. Thanks so much. Thanks, Steve. In 2019, the film and television industry put somewhere on the order of $2 billion into Ontario's economy. And for 2020, well, as for many other sectors, that's hard to know. Have productions gotten back to business? And how can they safely churn out the shows eager, cooped-up audiences are awaiting? Let's find out. Joining us on that, in Midtown Toronto, there's Cynthia Lynch, Managing Director of Film Ontario, and Alistair Hepburn, Director of Film, Television and Digital Media for Actra Toronto, and in the city's east end, Marla Boltman, Senior Vice President, Business Affairs for 
Hellfire Entertainment, and we are delighted to welcome all three of you to TVO tonight. I would like to just start by getting a sense of, you know, we know the year has been lousy so far, but, but now stuff is starting to happen again. And I want to get a sense from all of you of how optimistic or pessimistic or encouraged or terrified or distressed or you pick the right adjective. Um, Cynthia, start us off. How are you feeling? Uh, probably a little bit of all of the above, <laughs> to be honest, um, but truthfully optimistic. Uh, it's been a long six months for everybody, but certainly for the industry. But as we see production slowly getting back to work, putting in top of the line safety protocols, it's great to see that people are working and that soon we'll have some of our favorite shows to watch again. Amen. Alistair, how about you? Oh, I think uh, terrified and hopeful are the uh, are the best two. You know, uh, terrified that uh, you know that we've been out of work for so long, but hopeful the fact that uh, that everyone is coming back, right? The, the Canadian productions and the and the American and international productions. So, hopeful is uh, hopeful is definitely the key on this one. Can I just do a quick follow up with you there? You said everyone Absolutely. is coming back. Is that right? Yeah. Everyone's coming back. Yeah, they are. They absolutely are. We're gonna. We are. You are going to start seeing uh, trucks on the streets of Toronto very, very shortly. You know, with all of the big names and all of the big shows. Okay, Marla, how about yeah. you? Uh, well, maybe we can come back to the everyone's coming back a little bit down the road. But I guess <laughs> to answer the first question, I'm definitely feeling relieved and excited. I think production is really well known for long hours and extremely hardworking, dedicated workforces, both on and off the set. This is not a personality type of group of people that handles not working and being idle very well, I think. So I think getting them back to work is, is really key. And um, yeah. to Alistair's point, I'm really hopeful. I think our industry came together, re like really truly all the stakeholders came together mm -hmm. and they've, they found a way to get hundreds of people to work together in close quarters while still maintaining COVID safety, safe environments. And if we can do that, I think we can do anything. Marla, you opened the door, so let's walk through it. Uh, everyone's coming back? No, not everyone is coming back. <laughs> okay, what does that mean? So I think this is um, an obvious sort of segue to uh, an, a, a, an issue that's sort of plaguing us right now, which is the insurance issue. And so if I can take a moment just to summarize this very quickly for those who don't understand, um, you have to have production insurance to make a show. And anyone who was in production or who was close mm. to production had an insurance policy that would cover them even in the case of a COVID outbreak. But any new productions who didn't already have COVID insurance, insurance companies are now imposing COVID exclusions on them. That's basically the equivalent of having car insurance that doesn't cover you for a car accident. So for the majority of shows, insurance isn't a nice to have, it's a must have because of the way we make the shows. So I'll give you an example. If you do not, if you have a COVID exclusion and you try to go to camera and your star goes down, let's say we're talking about a big scripted drama and your star goes down and that star goes down for a couple of weeks, you're shutting production down for weeks. And there's hundreds of thousands of dollars associated with that shutdown that can't be reimbursed. And on top of that, we've got hundreds of thousands of dollars in COVID costs for all the new people that had to be hired, all the new protocols that had to be implemented, all the equipment that had to be purchased. All of this stuff is just dollar sign, dollar sign, dollar sign. And it all adds up. And if those two things are not dealt with, a lot of productions will not be coming back. I do want to follow up on this, but let me just, um, let's take a moment here just to give our viewers a sense about the kind of money that we're talking about, because this is mm -hmm. one of the most significant economic drivers in the province of Ontario. Sheldon, maybe you mm -hmm. could bring these numbers up. This is for 2019. It was a record-breaking year for film and television production in the province of Ontario. North of $2 billion spent on productions, 343 productions, basically one for almost every day of the year. That counts to 44,540 direct and spin-off jobs. It was a 15% increase in production from 2018, and it meant 7,500 new jobs for Ontarians. We know that 2020 uh, is not going to look anything like that. Cynthia, do we yet have or I guess, do you have any sense about uh, how much smaller the numbers are going to be when you look uh, on December 31st back at 2020? Well, they're not going to look like that, that's for sure. We know that between March and June, we lost seven, over $700 million in spending. So that money 
won't be spent this year. Um, we aren't as fast getting up to speed like we were. You said you mentioned you know we had 343 productions last year, almost one for every day of the year. Um, right now we have 15 shows in that are shooting, so a big difference. At this time last year we would have had 50 shows this week shooting, so uh, a more than 50 percent decrease. It does kind of depend on if we can find an insurance solution and how fast some of those productions can get back to work. Um, we are hoping to see a lot of people back to work by October, November, um, but it will be a greater than 50 percent decrease for sure. Okay. Alistair, I should give you a chance now to come back on some of the points that Marla made, namely the issue of yeah. can you really get back into production if you can't get COVID insurance for your biggest stars, et cetera, et cetera? There, there, look, there are definitely going to be a couple of shows that we that we don't see return in 2020. But what we have also now picked up is a bunch of producers who have never produced for film, television, or digital media before. And those folks are the theater producers. And they are charging ahead. So while we are only seeing 15 to 20 big productions shooting on the streets right now, for my members, for the Actor Toronto membership, they're actually now working uh, at a you know, at a good level, we are still way off of 2019, way, way off. But we've in, we've now suddenly invited all of these new producers to the table as well, who are now streaming theater into the digital into the digital world, which engages the services of performers, which is you know my membership, which is good for everyone. Hmm. Cynthia, does Film Ontario have any advice or recommendations uh, for production companies in terms of dealing with this insurance issue? <laughs> I would never give an individual producer some advice, <laughs> probably that. but I mean, each production has to do a risk assessment on their own particular production. So productions range in size, as I was just saying, from very small. Um, they may be comfortable taking on that risk if they only have a three or four day shoot and aren't risking a two week shutdown. Uh, for the series that don't have coverage, I, Marla laid it out perfectly, uh, if they can't absorb that type of financial hit. Yes. And in addition, their uh, investors aren't going to believe that they can finish their show without the insurance in place. So they're not even going to have access to the money to absorb the hit if it happens. So uh, the advice is to help us out in making the argument to government that some sort of insurance solution needs to happen and to keep looking at solutions. At, as Marla also said, we're a very creative industry and we do come up with creative solutions. So I think that if we continue to work together, we will find a solution and hopefully sooner rather than later so that we can have everybody back to work and not just parts of the industry. No, Marla, there's no question. I mean, the obviously the creative arts are filled with very creative people, but, but insurance sounds like a bit of a deal breaker. How are you working around that? Well, I think everyone in the industry knows the CMPA, which is the Canadian Media Producers Association, has been advocating very strongly and educating the government about this issue from day one. Other jurisdictions, unfortunately, are ahead of us. Other similar jurisdictions, like Australia and the UK and France, they have a government backstop in place for insurance. We are being told that an announcement in Canada is imminent. We just had a town hall yesterday with our minister, Minister Gilvaux, and he said the same thing. That's the federal I think there minister. Was a the federal minister, correct. Uh, there was a bit of a delay in light of the changeover uh, with the finance minister. I think we kind of got caught a little bit in that, is my guess, just from you know word on the street. But we have been the CMPA has been spending months educating those in the government that need to be educated on this issue. Obviously, the government is not in the insurance business, and uh, we understand that, and we appreciate you know from what we've been told all the time and effort they're taking to. Get a good understanding of this um, issue so that they can apply it you know the proper solution but because we are seeing it in so many other jurisdictions and they're seeing it sooner i think it's just adding a level of stress and anxiety to those in canada because we we're not seeing it here yet but we're hoping and we're hoping it's any day now alistair maybe you could give us some insight on you know as as productions ramp up again and everybody is extremely conscious about safety how do you ensure that a set, for example, is COVID safe? And not to get too prurient here, but I mean, how do you do a love scene nowadays uh, and, and physically distance at the same time? That's, uh, that's, that's the million dollar question. Um, really, 
what we're looking at is, so uh, both Cynthia and Marla touched on the fact that this industry has come together as a group, right? Uh, through Section 21, which is an offshoot of the Ministry of, uh, of Labor, we created uh, safety guidelines. Those return to work guidelines really provide producers with a tool belt of uh, you know, the personal protective equipment, all of the sanitization, as well as potential testing. Now, when it gets to the intimate scenes, we're looking at a, a couple of different things. We're really looking at a trust factor, right? The trust factor between the two, the, the two individuals that are in the scene. Testing is gonna be uh, paramount for that sort of thing, because you need to know that the person that you are about to, you know, disrobe with and, and you know, share a whole lot of bodily fluids with that, you know, that uh, you really want to have the trust in that individual. And then it takes the village surrounding that to ensure that uh, the rest of the world keeps them safe, right? Because they're not, they're not with their masks on. So everyone else on that set is now masked up, full PPE, face shields, uh, everything is sanitized within an inch of its life. I wonder, Cynthia, whether Film Ontario has had to come up with new guidelines mandating mandatory testing of actors, crew, whatever, on film or television sets. So they're not film Ontario guidelines, but certainly uh, the unions and the producers have worked together to come up with uh, guidelines. And basically, to give a rough outline, the more you are in close contact with other people, the more you get tested. And so depending, we have adopted, most big productions have adopted a bit of a zone system. So if you're in that zone that has a lot of close contact and like Alistair said, can't uh, have a mask on or you're working with actors or putting on their makeup, then you will get tested more often. But everyone is getting tested at least once a week. Marla, can you give us an example from one of your productions at Hellfire maybe on how you're doing testing now in a COVID era? Um, I think it, every uh, every show is different, and I think there's a bit of a negotiation sometimes with the union. So, for example, if you have American performers on your set, uh, SAG, which is the union that controls the American performers, they have some stricter guidelines in terms of what they expect for testing and the frequency of testing for both the performers and those directly around the performers. And so there, I think there's a little bit of negotiation there, and some shows are seeing... You, Put it this way, you're not going back to production with an American performer without having a conversation with SAG about what your testing schedule looks like. And I think um, you have seen some shows have delays. I think that's been in the news because they couldn't come to an agreement with SAG about what their testing schedule would look like. And I mentioned SAG because, I mean, obviously Alistair's on the call representing Canadian performers, but there are often a lot of American performers in Canadian shows. Uh, so... Actor can, I think Alistair can speak to if actor has specific guidelines around testing, but I just say that I, I think it's sort of show specific. And a I hate to say it, but I think a lot of it has to do with your budget and what you can afford. Testing's not cheap. The frequency of testing is not cheap. And, you know, you want to get your show in a position to be as safe as possible. And you want your cast and crew to feel safe walking on that show. And that costs money. Alistair, yeah. you want to follow up on that? Absolutely. This is about confidence. This is about ensuring confidence uh, on the set. In terms of the testing, we are looking at private testing. We are we are asking all producers to ensure that it is private testing so that we aren't putting any form of burden on the public health care system. Um, and it really is, it, it is show dependent. It is what the action of the show is. Uh, you know, uh, we have we have some great shows like Nurses, where a lot of the performers get to actually wear their masks on camera. Right, that that makes things much much safer. But then, when you have that small sort of family bubble like Kim's Convenience, then you know there's a lot more interaction. There's a lot more people coming in and out of the convenience store. So then you want to really start to look at what level of testing we need to look at. And really, it's about the, the the community infection rate, and SAG is specifically looking for the community infection rate to be low. The low standard that they are looking at is what already exists in pretty much every jurisdiction in Canada. So it, while they are sending their performers up here to do work, uh, you know, we're already in that, that low zone that they are looking for, but they do, have a, they do have a mandate in place where they're looking for multiple testings in the course of a week. Really, this is gonna be about what we need is rapid response testing. Really, that's, that's where we need to start uh, ensuring is available 
in Canada is that quick turnaround response because testing and then waiting 24, 48, 72 hours, that causes problems. It's what we need is rapid turnaround of an hour, hour and a half, so that we know that the person that you are about to kiss is negative. Well, Cynthia, I wonder whether or not any production companies have made entreaties to you at Film Ontario saying, you know, we didn't account for this in our budgets. We need some help from the province of Ontario in order to help make all this work. Is that happening? Absolutely. It's one of the first things that um, was on our agenda in terms of what sort of recovery support the industry would need. So we have had confirmation from the province uh, that the cost of testing and extra personnel would be eligible for the tax credits where, or it's get a bit technical, but where those tax credits cover more than just the cost of people. However, the domestic uh, producers don't have only, the tax credits only reimburse you for the cost of labor and not for any of the supplies. So we have made entreaties to government on behalf of our members to cover more of that cost. Uh, the province of Quebec stepped up and provided some support for their domestic producers for PPE. And we have been working very closely with Minister McLeod as part of her film and TV advisory panel to explore what our options are in that area. I actually was just going to ask you about Minister Lisa McLeod. She's the minister in the Ontario government responsible for the cultural industries of the province. And uh, I do recall a few weeks ago Doug Ford saying at one of his daily briefings, I'm hearing it every day from Lisa McLeod. Uh, you know, she's banging the drum hard for the cultural industries of the province. Uh, how, how effective do you think she's been so far in... You know, actually, you know, let me put this way. You're, 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 I won't get you to talk about technically the woman who's your boss, Cynthia. So let me go to Marla with this. Uh, how effective has she been able to be in helping your industries get what they need? To be honest, I actually, I can't speak to that. I don't certainly don't want to speak, put Cynthia back on the spot. I do know I'm hearing on various calls and I'm on various committees that everyone is still looking to the government to help specifically to the tax credits to allow some costs that typically wouldn't be covered to be covered because there are very limited options of where we can go to finance these costs. You have to understand that at the time, either when you're in production and shutting down and coming back up or about to go in production, your budgets are locked, your financing is fixed. Like in any other situation, money doesn't just fall out of the sky. And we're talking about anywhere from five to 25% increases because of COVID costs, hmm. you know, up to millions of dollars that has to be found somehow to make these shows go forward, or it's just a loss. In which case, Alistair, what do you want to see from the government of Ontario in order to help allay all of that? Oh, what we what we need them to do is listen to Minister McLeod, because Minister McLeod understands the economic driver here and understands what this industry is, actually brings to the province of Ontario. So it is it is support. It's unconditional support is is what we need at this time. Hmm. Cynthia, once the pandemic was declared, and we're going back several months right now, and then the province essentially shut down for a good chunk of time, and essentially there was no film or television production in the province at all, presumably ramping all of that up is a rather Herculean task. What did that involve to begin with? Sure. Uh, if I could just go back to what I could say. Stephen, to say technically, Minister Cloud is not my boss. Film Ontario is a private uh, corporation, but I thank you for allowing me to protect our important relationship with her. Gotcha. Um, Thanks for clarifying that. <laughs> thank you. So, one of the things um, very soon after the shutdown, uh, when sort of people were like, okay, what's going to happen when with all the people who are out of work and sort of conversations around what became CERB and sort of those kinds of supports. Once those sort of settled down a bit, I think the very first thing that people started thinking about was health and safety. And when we got back to work, uh, what would that look like? So Alistair talked about the Section 21 committee, and that was a huge part of ramping up. Um, and then the, just sort of every day, another question came up. The other very early thing that we've already talked about is insurance, of course. Um, but then also... Uh, what locations are going to be available? Our studio space is still going to be open. Um, are we going to have access to climate testing, which we do? Um, what happens with the quarantine period when you have to bring people from like American performers or directors across the border? How do we factor that into our schedule? Um, what do equipment suppliers have to do to make sure that the equipment that they rent out to that is safe and 
and good. And how do we um, communicate not just to people in the industry, but also to members of the general public who might walk by a film shoot, the 200 people gathered, not all of them wearing masks, to make the general public understand that everything is being done on set to keep not only those people safe, but the community around them. And then just clarity of when we were going to be able to get back to work. So we were in stage two of reopening. A few businesses were, a few businesses were actually able to keep working remotely, sort of in the post-production, visual effects, and animation area, and more of those in stage one. But the bulk of physical production opened in stage two. So getting clarity on what stage two actually means what areas of the province were in stage two when and was it the sort of the last big hurdle and now it's just putting all of those things that we were talking about for all of that time into practice and dealing with the new challenges every day that come up when you're trying to implement something in real life that you were thinking about in theory when you weren't actually on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Marla, let me do one uh, kind of typical example, I guess, with you. Uh, BC, before COVID, I can't imagine it was ever much of a problem trying to get American actors up here to participate in Canadian-based productions. Um, you know, PC, post-COVID, uh, have you had any difficult? I mean, the border is a different thing now, right? Have you had any difficulty getting Americans up here? Well, I, I mean, I guess you're looking at the twofold. You're looking at, are the Americans willing to come here and come back to work? That's one question. And then there's the legal aspect of, can we get them over the border? So interestingly enough, I think this is... Speaking of our country, this is an interesting point to make. I'm aware of some shows where when they shut down, the performers were offered to be flown home to the U.S. and they didn't want to go. They yeah. decided to lay low in Canada and that they felt safer here and they were going to wait for hopefully the show to come back up and stay here. And I, and I know that happened. I think that speaks volumes to um, the reputation that our, our country enjoyed before the pandemic and obviously... We enjoy a great reputation afterwards, which I can speak to after. Um, my understanding of the logistics is as long as you have a show in production and they have their work permits and they that they are allowed to travel, they are allowed to cross the border. It's for a work purpose. And they just have to be quarantined for 14 days. And those quarantine restrictions are unbelievably strict. And uh, there is random sort of spot checking to make sure people are following them. There are major consequences if they are not, financial consequences. Mm -hmm. So, yes, they can come, assuming they are willing. Um, but I've heard of perhaps older stars who are not interested at this point in getting involved. They don't want to be on a shoot. They're more nervous, understandably. They're higher risk. But for the most part, I think, you know, it's, it's a very passionate industry. And that passion is showing by people's eagerness to get back to work and do whatever it takes to do that. Because mm -hmm. I can only imagine what it's like being quarantined for two weeks in a place that is not your home, where you are not near any family and friends or any of your traditional supports. Can I just clarify something you said? Are, do you think there are American actors who have been here like since March or April who have decided to ride out the mm -hmm. pandemic in Canada rather yeah. than go home? Yes. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Huh, okay. Well, uh, that raises the next question then. Alistair, why don't you take this one on? You know, actors act, directors direct, producers produce, mm -hmm. but there's been none of that to do for, you know, for as long as five or six months. So what have they all been doing in the meantime? Oh, they, they have continued. They have continued to, uh, to create. Um, now, how they've done that is, is based on, you know, this little box that we're in right now, you know, with their web cameras. And a lot of our, a lot of our performers actually have at their homes, home studio setups. Uh, so a lot of our animation performers were able to continue. They were able to continue to, to do the records, to do the voice records. But then we also saw... You know, this great ingenuity happened and we we saw a couple of shows actually be created from the individual performers homes uh and it's it, you know there's there's one right now that is out uh, it has been released and it's fantastic it's called lockdown uh and it was done with young stars from their homes each using this this kind of device that i'm staring into right now it's uh it's really interesting stuff to watch what is that an online show or is it on a tv it's, channel yeah. or what no no it's an online show. It's produced by Sinking Ship. It's called Lockdown. I highly recommend it. It's great. Uh, 
That's not my cat, by the way. I don't know I was, who's say, that. I, that I, I was just going to say, some, somebody's cat, is, cat. Is, is determined to have a cameo on this program tonight, which is fine, which is fine. Too long being on camera. I just, <laughs> Alistair, I, I guess I got to know, do, do you have to pay actor scale to that cat for that appearance that just happened? <laughs> yeah, we'll have to speak with Cynthia about that one. I'm sorry, Cynthia. <laughs> uh, sorry, Alistair. He's not kidding, by the way. <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Marla, give me your best guess on this. Do you think that this country, I mean, you just pointed out that some American stars preferred to ride out the COVID crisis here as opposed to going back to the United States, where, let's be honest, they're, uh, they have not done as well as we have in, in uh, handling this crisis. Do you think Canada has the chance, therefore, of picking up more productions than it might otherwise get because uh, we seem to be doing better on the COVID scale than the Americans? I think that's a, a, a very real possibility. I mean, Canada has always been a very attractive country to produce, and um, I think that will continue to be remain the same. We've got you know the low dollar, we've got great crews, we've got great incentives. Uh, what we need to, I think, keep in mind as this is happening, as the U.S. struggles and productions look towards Canada to come here and shoot, um, we have to maintain that healthy balance between you know service Hollywood production and domestic production, and so. I think before we talk about growth, we have to talk about getting back to normal. And getting back to normal means getting back to that balance, which means we need these Canadian shows to go back. And while I think everything that Alistair's talking about is great, all these creative opportunities that have emerged and, you know, they're, they're fantastic. Are those the things that are putting thousands of people back to work and ingesting, you know, millions of dollars back into the economy? Maybe not. Maybe they will be down the road. Um, but the big picture, the big feature films, the big TV series and all that stuff, we have to get those cameras rolling, the domestic ones, like we talked about the insurance, the COVID costs, all that stuff needs to happen to get that balance, that gets us back to normal. And then I think everything on top of that will be gravy. And I think we will see the continued growth, especially as the US continues to struggle, we will see more and more um, foreign shows coming to Canada, yes. Hmm. Alistair, I asked a friend of mine the other day, so what have you seen lately that you like? And he said, I've seen all of Netflix. And that was the <laughs> yeah. answer. The answer was, in other words, you know, th there seems to be, well, maybe I should ask you, uh, is it your sense that there is now, because a lot of people have been in quarantine for a long time now, there is a real pent-up demand for new product out there that you people are expected to meet? New product, but also product that you've never taken a chance on before, right? That that's the really interesting thing is is now there's there are producers out there who are producing content that you would never have looked twice at before, and and now here's the chance to explore it. I think what we have learned over this is as as people have sat down on their couches over the last five and six months and watched all of Netflix, that that's what they've turned to. They've turned to arts. They've turned to culture. They've turned to entertainment. And, you know, my members, the, the performers, that's what they want to give. They just they want to give that that art, that culture, that entertainment back. And so there are lots of uh, new and interesting work out there as well that, that can be explored. Yes, we want we want the tentpole multi-million dollar productions to come up here because they put thousands and thousands of people to work. But in terms of providing care, in terms of providing comfort, you know, two performers and one camera can do that as well. And, you know, so really it's for, for my membership, it's about finding the balance and that creative output, as well as providing what they do best, which is provide, you know, cultural value to the, to the viewer at home. Hmm. Cynthia, I wonder if you, uh, we're down to our last few minutes here, and I wonder if you could give us a sense about what you think the long-term impacts of COVID-19 on the cultural industries of this province ultimately will be? Well, first and foremost, to sort of start where Alistair left off, I think definitely what this time of shutdown has shown to people who are sitting at home in quarantine has demonstrated the value of that content and how much they rely on that content to get them through hard times and how much they appreciate that content. So from the uh, citizen's point of view, I hope that there, there is an increased appreciation. There was already the appreciation, but I hope it's been increased over this time. Hopefully, we haven't lost too many workers permanently from the industry um, without work for six months. Uh, we have lost a bit of time in some of the things that we were starting to do as an industry, which was to train a new generation of content creators and bring a whole next generation of people into the industry 
um, with no, with no job opportunities, it's hard to give those people opportunities. So we have lost a bit of time on that. Hopefully, we will be able to make up that time. And I know even during lockdown, people have been having those conversations about what kind of training and mentoring we can offer going forward. Um, and I, we have also during lockdown been able to continue to develop our studio infrastructure. So I do hope that this will be a bad year and that we can come back stronger than ever. Uh, Premier Ford has said he would like us to be a $5 billion industry, and that would be a great goal to hit. Um, it's not going to be next year, but I think that we do have the ability to continue to build on the strengthened community that we developed over the time to be a stronger industry in the next year. That's Cynthia Lynch, the Managing Director for Film Ontario. Thanks as well to Alistair Hepburn, Director of Film, Television and Digital Media with Actor Toronto. Marla Boltman, Senior Vice President of Business Affairs, Hal Fire Entertainment. And I suppose if we're doing closing credits, we should name the cat, Cynthia. What's your cat's name? My cat's name is Mia. Thank you. There we go. Closing credits completed. Uh, good luck to all of you. We need your work. So get going. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. And that is the agenda for Wednesday, October 14th, 2020. War is hell, as the expression goes, but it has also defined who we are as a species, according to historian Margaret Macmillan. She joins us tomorrow on that. Also, we'll debate whether it's time for Canada to leave so-called Pearsonian diplomacy behind. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.